The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Forever in Glory by Richard Jensen from his album Worship. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome again to Pastor Yeshua. During this episode, we're going to be discussing the Bible, a message from God to man. Let us open in a word of prayer. Father, I just pray that you would open up your window of blessing, pour out your spirit upon those that hear this message, that their hearts might be softened and opened to the truth of what you're saying in your message in the Bible. I pray that our hearts would be convicted, converted, and conformed to the image of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The subject of the Bible is arguably the most foundational and central issue underlying every basic question and answer confronting mankind. The battle against the Bible from secular sources is alive and stronger today than perhaps ever. You cannot mention the words Bible, Scripture, or God's Word without evoking heated and vitriolic emotions from a majority of people. Indeed, if we were to conduct a survey poll regarding people's opinion and answer to the question, what is the reliability of the Bible, we would doubtlessly get myriad results. However, if we condense the answers to their fundamental options, what would we have? Well, I propose that we would have one of three answers. One, the Bible is a series of stories and or events which are myths, fables, make-believe, which are completely false, or lies. Two, the Bible is filled with stories, events, and information which We do not have enough information to know whether or not, as a whole, the Bible is reliable or not. And third, the Bible is accurate and reliable. Those are our options. The outcome and answer to the above is not merely an academic issue. Rather, the proper answer is one which profoundly affects every aspect of human experience and endeavor. Despite the difficulties, the greatest challenge before mankind is to overcome the profound misinformation mischaracterizations and misunderstandings which exist regarding the Bible. More difficult yet is to carefully search for and examine the truth without being misguided by fixed biases, preconceptions, emotional investments, or assumptions from which we refuse to depart. Now frankly, I'm comfortable beginning with the premise that the Bible, like any other piece of literature, can, should, and does begin as a, quote, questioned document, unquote. The goal, essentially, we propose to come to is one of three possible inevitable conclusions regarding the veracity of the Bible. A. The Bible is completely false and an erroneous book. B. We don't have enough information to, quote, know, unquote, whether the Bible is reliable or not. Or C. The Bible is reliable and trustworthy as to what it says. Ordinarily, we might propose to start at some logical beginning and move chronologically and exhaustively through all of the various arguments, the issues, the counter-arguments and debates to attempt to answer every question and come to a conclusion. Admittedly, this discussion will be limited to a summary overview of the points and merits which have historically been discussed and presented 
exhaustively many times in print on the internet and elsewhere. So to begin with it's important to make a few observations and comments which are not only ultimately pertinent but crucial to keep in mind which will hopefully help us to understand before we begin. Now these observations and comments are by disclaimer admittedly those which are drawn from scripture but they are nonetheless important to understand the Bible. There are six points which I wish to present up front. There will also be three points I will make at the conclusion of this presentation. Ultimately I would like to make one final point which will take the form of at this point a prediction which I would like you to make a mental note of, which I will reserve for my final conclusion. Point one, the Bible ultimately presents itself as a revelation of God's Word. That is to say that the various books and the texts are intended to be a message from God, the Creator, to man, His creation. As such, it is logical that working backwards by studying the Bible, we should be able to find and understand that message which is intended for us. Point two, creation, i.e. all that was, including man's relationship to God, began initially in perfection by result of God's hand. Shortly thereafter, all creation, including man's relationship to God, was and remains warped and damaged by the effects of man's choice to rebel, sin, against God. Point three, since the effects of sin presently exist, Man can and should expect that all sin and all of its attributes will affect our approach to and our understanding of everything, including our approach and understanding of the Bible, as well as our relationship to God. Point four. If point one is true, we expect and predict that God will include some methodology, mechanism, or information built into his word or his general revelation of himself, whereby honest and sincere men and women can be assured that the message being received is intact. Point five. If point two and three are true, we expect and predict that God will at some point work within his creation to create a mechanism whereby his mercy can find the power and or ability to overcome our condition and effect of sin and return us to a relationship with God. Point six. Lastly, we would expect that, like any information given by design and purpose, the Bible will ultimately present a uniform and integral message. Given the aforementioned points, I propose that there could be no greater overall theme than that of perhaps Book of John, chapter 20, verse 31, which says, quote, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Unquote. Now, as we uh, begin our introduction, I would like you to think of understanding the integrity of the Bible in terms of the acrostic tape. That's T-A-P-E. These four letters are analogous to the legs of a stool, if you will, or pillars from which the basis or foundation on which the reliability and authenticity of the Bible rest. The first leg, T, is textual integrity. The second leg is archaeological integrity. The third leg, P, is prophetical integrity. The fourth leg, E, is evidence of changed lives. Together, these four evidences are the tape measure, if you will, which gauge the integrity of the Bible. Together, they form a four-legged stool upon which the veracity and trustworthiness of Scripture rest. That being said, let's start with T, textual integrity. As I said, the first leg of biblical reliability is textual integrity. How can we trust what the Bible says, what is written? By way of overview, as we begin our study and discussion of the Bible, the Bible contains 66 books which were written by 40 authors over a period of approximately 1,500 years, and the Bible is divided into the Old and New Testament. The Bible was written primarily in Hebrew and Greek, with a small portion written in Aramaic. Now, many skeptics believe that the Bible has been drastically changed over the centuries, that there are these thousands of different versions, if you will, of the Bible. In reality, we find that the Bible has been translated 
into a number of different languages from the original first into Latin then into English and the other languages however the ancient manuscripts the, the originals if you will were written in Hebrew Aramaic and Greek these have been reliably copied over the centuries with very few alterations for example the Old Testament many years ago skeptics claimed that the Old Testament was invented or changed by the New Testament apologists long after Christ's death ostensibly in an effort to bolster Christian theological beliefs one of the leading supports to this belief was the fact that for some time the earliest known version of the Bible was the Hebrew copy of the Old Testament was the Masoretic text which dated around 800 AD. As time went on later there was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls which then forced the critics to date the Old Testament further back to around 70 AD. More importantly though was in comparing the scripts and texts of the two the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls to the Masoretic text we, we find that ultimately that there was a 95.5% accuracy rate between the two. So they agreed with each other. Next, we have the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament dating back to the 2nd century BC, that is before Christ, when we, and when we compare these texts, which have an, about an 800 to 1000 year gap between them, we are, lo and behold, amazed to again find that we have a 95% accuracy rate of the texts which are uh, identical with only minor variations and few discrepancies. Then lastly we have the oldest Bible text archaeologists have discovered of the Pentateuch, the uh, first five books of the Bible which appear to date to the 7th century BC which is even before the destruction of uh, Jerusalem by uh, Babylon which dates to the time of Solomon's temple. Yet, until this discovery, many scholars were claiming that these texts were fabricated after Jerusalem's reconstruction and that uh, there may have been no such temple at all. Now, as we move to the uh, New Testament, we find that skeptics and critics often lodge several complaints against the reliability of the New Testament, which, when examined honestly, tend to be disingenuous at best. Uh, for example, one, they claim that the New Testament contains some 200,000 errors in comparing approximately 5,600 texts and manuscripts uh, known to exist. Two, they claim that the New Testament was written so long after the events that it is impossible to have reliability or accuracy as to the events. Three, they claim that the New Testament was in the hands of, quote, the church, unquote, and as a result, we have no way of being assured that there have not been deletions, insertions, or changes by supposedly zealous persons who have a uh, axe to grind. And fourth, they claim that the New Testament contains contradictions uh, with itself and or with the Old Testament. So, having these allegations, let's examine these above complaints uh, briefly and see exactly what a more honest evaluation gives us. One, again, the skeptics claim that the New Testament contains some 200,000 variants, if you will, or errors, as they're so-called. Let's ask a question. Is 200,000 really a devastating amount? Well, as it turns out, the answer is somewhat relative. Are we dealing with a one-page letter or perhaps a novel. In order to have a better comparison we need to really define terms. As we look at the New Testament we find that the New Testament contains some approximately 138,000 plus words. By contrast most publishing standards say that the mainstream novel today is rarely less than 70,000 words and the average novel has approximately 85,000 words while the monster fantasy type epic novel would have approximately 120,000 words. In today's quote advanced technology unquote authors have the luxury of using word processors with built-in spelling, punctuation, and grammar programs. Even so authors may work through numerous edits, rewrites, and proofreadings. Then the initial manuscript is submitted to a publisher who conducts a content edit, a line edit, a copy edit, as well as one or more 
rounds of proofreading before it's finally ready to be printed and available on the shelves. Under these expensive and optimal conditions, experienced publishers concede that a 1% error rate would be, quote, a rare and exceptional outcome, unquote. So, for example, if you take a novel with an average uh, 85,000 words in it, and in, with those 85,000 words, you include the spaces between the letters, the punctuation marks, the periods, the commas, and, and everything else, you now have a novel with some approximately 425,000 characters in it from cover to cover. This being the case, using the publisher's, quote, rare and exceptional rule of 1% under optimal conditions, using advanced technologies, we might today hope to publish an average novel, that is 85,000 words, which would have a resultant 1% total of approximately 4,250 errors in that novel. The question now needs to be asked, what percentage might we expect to find when we do not have the luxury of advanced technology, quote-unquote, or of having, quote, optimal conditions, quote-unquote? In order to answer that question, we need to take a brief look at what we now know of the conditions present during the time of the writing of the New Testament. So, for example, what would be the average error rate that we would expect given the following? For example, the New Testament writers hand-wrote their material using pens made from dried reeds cut to a point slit in the end as writing instruments. Uh, using a compound of charcoal, gum, and water for ink, and papyrus or parchment for paper. What would we expect, given the fact that there was not one author writing the New Testament, but rather eight authors writing in different locations at different times? Three, what would we expect to find, considering that the New Testament writers, opposed to today's writers, faced fierce opposition, persecution, adversity, hostile environments, imprisonment, and ultimately, in most cases, death. What would we expect to find, fourthly, given the fact that the New Testament writers had no erasers, they didn't have liquid paper, word processors, editors, proofreaders, copy machines, or printing machines. Thus, a small scroll constituting today's book could and would take days to hand copy character by character, word by word. Consequently, personally owning a copy of a scroll of one book of the Bible was expensive. Having several, much less all of them, was not only rare, but very cumbersome to carry, given the fact that they would be comprised of multiple large scrolls. Another aspect we need to emphasize is that while skeptics quote that there are these supposed 200,000 variants, many people lose sight of the fact that these 200,000 variants are found among 5,600 different manuscripts written by different people. This being the case, we are in a better position to equate the relative outcomes in perspective between the reliability of the Bible and other documents, such as today's novel, as it applies to textual variances. For example, you will recall that if we take today's average modern hypothetical novel consisting of 85,000 words, or again, 425,000 characters written by one author using advanced technology under optimal conditions, we would wind up with a finished novel having about 4,250 errors, which is, again, a 1% error rate, which is considered by today's standards, quote, rare and exceptional, unquote. Next, if we took the same novel consisting of 85,000 words or 425,000 characters and had it written and copied independently 5,600 times by different authors using advanced technology and under optimal conditions, we would wind up with a finished novel containing about 23,800,000 errors with the same 1% error rate, which is considered rare and exceptional. 
Thirdly, let's take a look at the uh, finished New Testament, which again has approximately 138,000 words. This equals a total of approximately 690,000 characters. So if we were to take the finished New Testament and have it written or copied 5,600 times by different authors using advanced technology and under optimal conditions, we would wind up with the finished New Testament containing 38,640,000 errors with the same 1% error rate uh, considered rare and exceptional. This prorates out to approximately 6,900 errors per manuscript. Now, using the error rate of 200,000 given by the critics, which are found among the 5,600 different manuscripts, we find that doing the math, the resultant error rate is not 1% as with today's abilities, but rather 3 eighths of 1%. This prorates out to about 36 errors per manuscript. Let us not forget that this result is without using, quote, advanced technology and without having, quote, optimal conditions, unquote. So the conclusion is that if 38 million plus errors qualifies as a rare and exceptional outcome with modern advantages, what word would we use to describe an error rate of 200,000 without modern advantages? Dare I suggest inspired? When we examine the variances of the New Testament manuscripts, we find that there are none which would alter basic Christian doctrine. When looking at the glass as half full instead of half empty, we see that rather than focusing on what we now know to be an inspired 200,000 errors, according to the skeptics, we see, more importantly, that we have 3 billion 864 million characters which are found to agree among 5,600 manuscripts written by different authors in different places without using advanced technology and without having optimal conditions. Perhaps with this in mind, we can move from inspired to supernatural revelation and direction by God, which after all was the contention all along. Let's examine the second allegation. The second allegation was that the New Testament was written so long after the events that it is impossible to have reliability or accuracy as to the events. Well, again, this is a relative subject. The secular skeptic is being hypocritical with their complaint since many, if not most, secular ad adherents have no problem believing theories of evolution, despite the fact that the original events occurred sometimes allegedly many millions of years ago. Yet these same uh, skeptics have unassailable issues with the fact that the New Testament was written some 15 to 100 years after the events, as opposed to millions of years. In order to assess whether this 15 to 100 years after the fact is uh, something which is abnormal, we need to look at manuscripts written at or around the same time to see how they in fact compare. And it turns out that as we look at various texts and manuscripts written at or around the same time as those of the Bible, or in particular the New Testament, we can compare the New Testament to Caesar, Plato, Tacitus, Suetonius, Homer. Very few are going to have any problem saying, oh, these are historical works. You know, these are factual things that uh, happened, and they're not going to have any problems relying on what was said uh, for the most part. In conclusion, with regard to the New Testament being written so long after it that as such it's unreliable as to its accuracy, the late Professor F.F. Uh, F. Bruce was one of the world's foremost textual history critics uh, and, as a side note, a non-Christian, and he said of the New Testament, quote, The interval between the dates of the original composition and the earliest existent evidence becomes so small that it is in fact negligible, especially when compared to the dates and academically accepted historical documents such as those detailing Roman history. The last foundation for any doubt that the scripts of the Old and New Testaments have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity 
and the general integrity of these works may now be finally established and proved probably to be the most authentic historical documents known to man." Unquote. Now the third accusation which came to him from the skeptics was that the New Testament was in the hands of, quote, the church, unquote. And as a result, we have no way of being assured that there have not been deletions, insertions, or changes by ostensibly zealous persons with an axe to grind. Well, right out the gate, I would contend that this allegation is basically a red herring argument made clearly to plant the idea that because the church or its members were somehow invested in the outcome, that they were motivated to manipulate the documents to their desired outcome. Firstly, there is presently no credible evidence to support the allegation that any person or persons inside the early church made additions, deletions, or changes to the New Testament which in any way substantially alter the outcome of the central message. Two, rather than this being a supposed deficit, we find that the early church was actually an asset to the integrity of the New Testament. The reason is that the New Testament text is sourced and found in thousands of quotations found throughout the writings of the uh, the early church fathers from 100 to 450 A.D., who followed the apostles and gave leadership to the fledgling church. And it has been observed that if all the New Testament manuscripts and versions mentioned above were to disappear, it would still be possible to go back to the early fathers and reconstruct the entire New Testament based on their quotes with the exception of perhaps 15 to 20 verses. In many cases, what the early church fathers wrote about in the Bible has later been validated by independent documents discovered after the time when the church fathers wrote. Now if the early church fathers, uh, writers and so forth, were manipulating the, the documents and copying them in such a way so as to be to their advantage, then we would expect that in comparing these documents that the documents later discovered would differ from the original quotations made by the early church fathers. Instead, we find that they, there's this amazing agreement. Fourthly, if we are going to assume people are willing to manipulate information, evidence, and documents to their advantage rather than seeking truth, then we must allow for this contingency both for the uh, church fathers equally as for the uh, evolutionary scientists since they are both human. The fourth allegation and contention made by the skeptic is that the New Testament contains contradictions with itself and or with the Old Testament. In evaluating this contention, we find that the majority, if not all, contradictions are in fact better labeled as, quote, apparent contradictions, unquote. The reason for this is that the apparent contradictions are typically, if not uh, usually, understood and resolved by one or more of the following. 1. Correctly translating the original languages involved. 2. By correctly placing the issue in question into context with the immediate sentence, verse, chapter, book, as well as the overall Bible itself. 3. By correctly understanding the culture, the events, and the environments of the respective writers with which we're talking about. Fourth, by correctly understanding God's theological perspective rather than reading into it our own preconceived bias. Fifthly, by correctly remembering that while the Bible is inspired, the Bible is composed of many genres. These genres are which record information ranging from, quote, Thus saith the word of the Lord, to simply recording historical events without comment, or approval from God or its authors. And sixthly, by remembering that errors can come about from a single slip of a pen or from incorrectly copying the original text by a scribe or a copyist. With these thoughts in mind, this brings us to the conclusion of part one of our study, The Bible, A Message from God to Man. I welcome you to join us again for part two where we will continue our study into the veracity and reliability of the Bible.